started. Okay, it's all good. Screen is up. Okay. So first thing first, um, the exam exam one is scheduled on next Wednesday. Um, so you have a week, you know, basically to prepare for exam one. I think that's that's enough time, but you have to use your time wisely. Okay, depending on where you are now. Okay, you know, because you know some people are already kind of keeping up with the class the whole time, and they are not. They won't need as much time. But if you need to catch up with the rest of the class, then you need to use your time wisely because one week flies by just like that. Okay, second thing is Mesa. So if you need any tutoring help, uh, Mesa, I know there are Mesa tutors who can help, but the issue is Mesa has requirements. Okay, if you want to be tutored, you have to meet certain eligibility thing. So you have to, so I'm looking up right now. So if I look up American River College Mesa, and this is the link, and you can find it the same way, just use Google, American River College MESA Mesa. And there's an eligibility requirement in this case. So if you want to be tutored, you need to become a member first, and they're still open for membership. So that means, you know, if you want to become a member of Mesa, you can do so. And Mesa is basically located on the first floor of this building. And if you walk in the STEM home base, it is the political back room. They also have their own door, okay? So you can walk into the Mesa Center, you know, using its own door. So the eligibility, they didn't say here, because I, I guess whoever wrote this was not a computer science person. So there's no logical operator connecting all the requirements. It is a conjunction, which means you have to meet all of these requirements. So a first generation college student, which basically means you know parents, your parents you know, um, are not have never been a college student, uh, be working to transfer to what a transfer and a first bachelor's degree. I think all of you probably meet that requirement. Qualify for financial aid and be majoring in a STEM field. Computer science is definitely a STEM field. Now the only one thing that I'm not really sure is whether these two are ORed or are they ended? In other words, uh, for someone who's a first generation college student but does not qualify for fin financial aid, is that person still eligible? I do not know, okay, and vice versa as well. So I'm not really sure whether this is an AND versus a OR. Um, so if you are in a situation where you meet only one of these two requirements but not both, I would go ask Mesa. Okay, I would go down there and just ask them right away and see if you are eligible for Mesa tutoring. So the good thing about Mesa tutoring is I know there are tutors in the Mesa Center who have, who have okay, maybe one, maybe multiple, who has slash have taken this class in previous semesters. Okay, um, I do not believe we have any LRC tutors who have taken this class. So you know, that may not be a usable resource. So there you go. Do we have any questions about um, the Mesa Center, you know, where it is, you know, how to find all this information and so on? Okay, if there are no questions, I will close this tab. <clears throat> and I will also show the clock. Okay, oh, that's not what I expected. There we go, okay. So now we get the clock, I'll put it back here. <clears throat> because we are recording the key to the quote unquote practice exam, and I'm gonna use quote unquote all the time because it is there's no guarantee what your exam is going to look like. So do not um, use the exam from last semester as a reference of, oh, so mine is gonna be the same and I can just prepare it in this way and I just have to regurgitate here you know, what we learned in this class. The exams, I can tell you right away already, all the exams of this class are not about regurgitation. So being re able to regurgitate is not going to help. It has to do with you understand the material enough that you can apply it in the exam to solve problems. That is the focus of this class. But you never told us about this. Yes, I did, in the syllabus, okay? In the syllabus, it was clearly stated 
how I test in this class. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So what we'll do is we are going to talk about the exam, and I will solve the problems one by one, step by step, so that you know, you know, how I would have you know, done the exam if I was a student. So here we go. It is in the announcement already. Um, if you have not opened this attachment already, um, I think for the next exam, change your strategy. Okay, as soon as I give you an exam to from a previous semester, open it right away and try to answer the questions right away. Okay, do not wait. Okay, so that's what I'm going to say. All right, so here we have the exam. It is already up here you know, from, I think, last time. We talked about it a little bit. So I think if somebody has not looked at this exam you know, in, individually, you know, out of the class, I would be slightly concerned because you know, you're not, you, those people are not utilizing the resources of this class to the fullest extent. But this time, I'm going to go over this really slowly, okay, just to make sure that we all understand you know, what is expected. Okay, so this second line item here, the exam is an individual exam specific to the student, blah, blah, blah. We don't, I don't track the student ID anymore. In other words, I do not make one exam per student anymore. But you do have to write down your student ID as well as your last name and your first name in the exam. So this way, I know whose exam I'm grading because otherwise, I can grade an exam, get a score, and I have no idea you know, where that goes, okay, you know, whose your know, exam it is. So you have to make sure that you write in a legible way, okay? It is your name. Please respect yourself and write your name in a legible way so that I can find you on the roster. All right, so moving on. No collaboration is permitted in the attempt to answer questions of the exam. So that means, you know, you're all going to work on this individually in the classroom, and on the day of the exam, we will have all the computers you know, put down you know, back into the, uh, the tray so that you have the maximum amount of area you know, so that you can lay out all your stuff. You can, um, you know. the, most people like to kind of take the exam apart and then just kind of lay out all the sheets. Okay? You know, I think that helps. Um, it's up to you to decide how you want to work. Um, Paper-based content that was prepared prior to the exam can be used as long as there's no interaction or collaboration in the attempt to answer the questions of the exam. So that means, yes, go ahead. Oh, um, are you recording? Yes, I am recording, but thank you for double checking. All right, so that means you, know, you can bring anything that is either printed or handwritten prior to the test, but they have to be on paper. So no iPad, no tablet, no computer whatsoever. You cannot use the computer you know, or the workstation in the classroom. It is all paper-based. Are we good so far? Okay, all right. So what does that mean? It means bring your writing instruments. Okay, I cannot tell you how many times in an exam like this, with warning ahead of time, people will walk into the classroom to take an exam and go like, I don't have anything to write with. Can somebody borrow or lend me a pen or pencil? Okay, do not be that person. Okay, bring your writing instruments, your favorite pen, your lucky pen, your lucky pencil. Bring those. Okay. Um, do not share or discuss any part of this exam with anyone in class or otherwise until the next class meeting or otherwise permitted by the instructor. This has to do with there are cases where people are. In, on a medical reason, because of medical reason, they cannot take the exam on that day. So I don't want anyone to kind of disclose the content of the exam to those people, because um, that would not be fair to the rest of the class. Okay. Uh, moving on, grading is based on the explanation and steps, demonstration of understanding of knowledge and problem solving skills, and not only on the final answer. Okay. In other words, I have to know how you get to the final answer, not just what the final answer is. So you have to demonstrate to me that you know how to solve the problem. And just, give me, just having the final answer is not a demonstration. You have to show me the steps in doing so. Yep. Okay, so if we define the 
properly demonstrate our understanding, but we have to have a miscalculation. So our final steps, our, our final answer is wrong, but we still get all the steps in general. Um, you get most of the points. You'll get a. So I only grade in A, B, C, D, F. So you would be getting quote unquote a D in that case because the answer is not 100 percent. But you have demonstrated sufficient evidence that you know how to. Okay. All right. And moving on, sufficient explanation means your answer connects. So it's all about connection, okay? I'm looking for those connections. It's connection between the definition and concepts that we have already talked about in class to, you know, uh, via logical and or mathematical steps to find the answer of a question. So I will show you, okay? In fact, I'm going to do this, you know, in this, and in this particular class. So I'll show you what I mean by that. And then write your answer on answer sheets. I do not provide extra paper you know, for, for you to write your answer on. So bring your own paper so that you can write your answer on it. Um, and you can pre-write your name and your ID on those extra pieces of paper. So this way, if I lose, you know, if I drop everything and there's no paper clip, I can still figure out, oh, this belongs to this person over here. This belongs to that person over there. And you can do all of that before the exam, okay? Just you know, get a bunch of your know, binder paper, whatever inexpensive paper you can find. Write your name on it, write your ID on it, and bring those pieces of paper to class on that day of the exam. Are we good so far? All right. So some of you prefer fancy paper, like your graph paper. That's fine. If some of you prefer to have just a blank piece of a sheet of paper, that's fine too. You know, it's your choice. Okay, what kind of paper you want to use to write your answers on. All right, so we are now moving on to the first question. And as I said a little bit earlier, only one of these apply, and it is question number three for this particular version. So I can tell the whole class ahead of time already that I typically pre prepare um, multiple versions of the same question so that you know um, there, there will be typically maybe 10 choices you know, out of the entire class okay, for each question. Um, so, so that this way, no two students in the class is going to get the same set of questions, almost guaranteed. All right, so we'll take a look at question number three and see how we can answer that question. And the question or the answer itself is free-formed, which means any way you can explain that sufficiently to me is okay. If you like to draw arrows and you know, link things you know, using a graphical way, that's fine. If you prefer to explain things you know, verbally, that's fine, but it's going to take you time, okay? So you can use shorthand if you want to make things a little bit shorter. So I will also demonstrate what you can do to use your know, shorthand in this class. Okay, so I'm going to write down the problem on my tablet, and then we'll switch to the tablet so that you guys can see how it is solved. All right, so this one is pretty easy. We only know D0 is a 1. And we only know that T1 is a zero. Okay, so let me switch to the tablet here. All right, so we are looking at a one-bit subtraction. Read the questions carefully. Okay, that is the first thing I have to tell people, is you have to read the questions carefully. Do not miss anything in the question so that you know exactly what I'm looking for. Okay, all right. So now we look at this and go like, okay, so let me see what this is going, this is how this is going to work. We have the x, y, q, d, and t rows, okay? This is how we do subtraction. <clears throat> and then we have column 0, column 1, okay? Because we only have a one-bit subtractor, so that means there are only two bits here for us to be concerned about. And we are given what is d0, oops, I, okay, that was... That's my bad, sorry. T goes here and then D goes here. So D0 is a 1, T1 is a 0. This is all we know. So based on this, how do we figure out all of the other bit positions? That is the question. That's what, it, that's what the question is asking. But ultimately, I'm also looking for how you reason it out. Okay? So the squares are representing, or the rectangles, uh, are representing the unknown, okay, what we need to figure out given that we only know one bit is a zero and one bit is a one. Okay, so the first thing is, how do we get started, okay, because that's a very, yeah, go ahead. Oh, 
Definitions, very good, okay? So I told the other classes already, if I get a penny every single time I mention definitions, I'll be a rich man. I don't need my salary anymore. I just collect all my money by mentioning definitions and definition and definition and so on. So the question is, what definitions are we talking about? Definitions for the um, subtraction. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's kind of go through some of those definitions. So D of I, oops, okay, wrong, wrong tool. Okay. So D of I is, how do we define D of I using a Boolean operator of the other bits? So I will kind of save us some time and I'll put it here, but you should know at least where to find these definitions, okay? D is the exclusive OR between Q and T. Um, and then Q of I in return is the exclusive OR between the X and the I, X and the Y. And then the most difficult one is T of I plus 1. It is defined to be the negation of XI and YI or the negation of uh, QI and TI. Okay, so these are the Boolean operations. And the R and B operations or the R and B functions are not really particularly useful in this case because they are not as useful for deducing you know, the other bits. So you have to know the binary uh, operator definition in this case. So I'll pause right here. If what you see here is foreign to you, like I have never seen this before, or I have no idea what that is, I would allocate a lot of time to catch up with the class. Okay, because if we have talked about all of this stuff already, I talked about the rationale behind this, I talked about the application of these, we have examples in class to illustrate how they work. So, so for people who feel that I'm not really sure why, you know, what these other things are, I do not remember that we talked about these things, I would just allocate time to review all the material because we have talked about this already. Okay, so do we have any questions about what is exclusive or? So no questions. No questions, all right, okay, very good. Then we move on, okay? So remember, connection is what we are doing. So the first thing is we want to be able to connect the definitions, which is this, this bunch of stuff here. Can you guys see the faint your circle when I touch the screen? Yeah. Okay, good, I, excellent, that's the intention. So we want to connect you know, these definitions over here to what we know already, the one, and the zero, because that's the first thing that we can see, say, is to, is to go like, oh, we don't know some of the bits here, okay? We don't know what is X, what is Y, what is Q, what is T of zero, but we know what is T of one, and we know what is D of zero. So we'll start with those. So now we say D of zero is a one, and it is the result of Q of I exclusive or with, okay, I take it back a little bit here. It's Q of zero exclusive or with T of zero. I just applied the definition. I made a connection between what is given in the question and one of the definitions that is applicable in this case. Is that okay? So the strategy works across all of your classes, particularly your STEM classes. The specific example here is specific to this particular exam, but the approach of finding definitions and relating those definitions that you have learned in class with what is written in the exam question itself is typically applicable across all of your classes. It can be calculus, linear algebra, can be physics, and so on. You know, the approach still applies. But what, is, what makes this class a little bit interesting is now we can say, hmm, this implies certain things, okay? What does it imply? This gives me, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. No, 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 go ahead. Okay, so since mm -hmm. D of zero, D of zero is one, it means either Q of 
No, t of zero is not guaranteed a zero. It is one of the input is an unknown. Oh no, I said d of zero. Oh, d of zero. Thank you. Sorry. Okay, I missed that. Sorry. Um, so since d of zero comes back as one, then just so we know that to be true, then that means either d of zero is one or t of zero is one. Or. Or t of zero. The other way around. Yeah. Okay. So what we know here is we know that. Okay, let me see if this captures what you meant to say. Okay, so this means you know d q of zero is one. Uh, this is and. Okay, we can just use the regular and here. Okay, t of uh, zero is a zero, or q of zero is a zero, and t of zero is a one. Does that make sense? Okay. But we, there's no easy way just using this definition to resolve which one it is. Okay, so we have like, okay, out of four possibilities, now we are down to two. Okay, which is good. We are working in the right direction. So now, is, you know, in addition to d0, we are now going to look at t of 1. t of 1 is known to be a 1 because it is one of the bits that we know what the value, what the value is. Uh, and that is the negation of x of 0 and y of 0, or the negation of q of 0 and k, t of 0. So once again, I made a connection between the definitions that we know, or that we should know, with the question itself, with some of the facts that are given in the question itself. So this is a connection between the definition and what is given to you in the question. So these are really important steps because it gives you a starting point to you know, approach the question. Other than, you know, instead of looking at the question, it's like, I have no idea where to start. Yeah, we know where to start, okay? You know, the question is, do we, can we con continue with all of these steps to get to the final answer? Okay, so what does that mean? So what does that imply? Well, we have the disjunction being a zero. So what does it mean to the either side of the disjunction? It locks down certain things, even though it's kind of like, oh, but that's kind of fuzzy. Yes, it is fuzzy, but it still gives us constraints. So that's the other concept is constraints. Constraints simply mean, you know, we know certain things do not apply anymore. We can rule out certain possibilities. So those are constraints. So in this case, what is the constraint once we understand the result of the OR is a false? We know that the entire, since the entire thing has to be or false, and we know that OR is simply if either one of sides are true or, or if both are true. Mm -hmm. not as true. Okay, it comes out as true. So since we know that it comes out as false, both sides would have to be false. Exactly. Okay, very well put. So this means you know, we know the left-hand side of the OR and the right-hand side of the OR, they both have to be false by themselves, okay? So we'll write it down. So this is what I'm looking for when I'm look, reading your answer, is the reasoning, okay? Now, you don't have to use words, okay? Because we, if we are using words, you're going to spend most of the time actually just writing, okay? You can just use mathematical symbols like this, okay? So what we know now is the negation of x0 and y0 has to be false, and on top of that, we also know the negation of Q0, T0 also has to be false. Now, does that automatically give us you know, what is X0, Y0, Q0, T0? No, but it gave, gave us constraints again, okay? It gave us certain things like, okay, we can check possibilities against these two, then we can limit, you know, what can be, we can start to lock down the values of the individual bits. Okay, so now I'm going to use your know, lines, you know, because it's more intuitive for me, more intuitive for me to do that. If you want to use labels, you know, that's fine too in your answer. So now I look at these two re these requirements, and I'm just okay. The other way to do this is to use I'm going to use labels. Basically, they're the same thing as a tunnel. Okay, so I'm going to use um, a you know to represent this expression here. Uh, this expression is known as B. Uh, this one is C. And this one is D. 
I'm just using labels so that I don't have to mention the entire thing again. Okay, so how is that going to be helpful? Well, I'm just focusing on Q and T because you know, we already locked down Q and T to only two possibilities. So let's focus on that because you know, we can now further reduce the possibilities. If we can block, if we can rule out one of the two possibilities, the other one has to be the right answer. Is that correct? Because we know the answer has to be one of those two. If you rule out one of them, then the other one has to be the right answer. So the question is, how do we rule it out? This one. That's a constraint. Go ahead. Okay. All right. So now we look at A, and the other one is D. Okay. These two implies, okay, question? Yeah. Okay, that's okay. All right, I just, I thought I heard you mentioning something. So A and D combined implies that um, if Q0 is a 1 and T0 is a 0, then Q, the negation of Q0, T0 is a 0. On the other hand, if Q0 is a 0 and T0 is a 1, then the negation of Q0 and T0 is going to be a 1. This is contradicting. This contradicts that D, uh, T1, this contradicts T1 is a 0. So that means it'll conclude that Q0 is a 1 and T0 is a 0. So now we just lock down two of the uh, four bits that we have to resolve. Is that okay? <clears throat> Great. So now what, what about x0 and y0? Same deal. Okay. So now we say q0 is a 0. It is the result of x0 exclusive or with y0. Once again, this is coming from the definition. I'm connecting a new found fact of this particular puzzle with the definition related to it. Is that okay? So once again, the definition plays a really important role because now I know, oh, okay, this is a constraint. What does that imply? Well, it implies that x0 is a 1 and y0 is a 0 or x0 is a 0, and y0 is a 1. Because if the exclusive OR is a 1, that means whatever is to the two sides of the exclusive OR, they have to be different. And there's only one way for Boolean values to be different. One is true and one is false. Are we still doing okay so far with this part? I think we have seen something like this before. We, we saw this earlier. So now the question is, I have to lock down exactly which one it is, okay? We know it's either this one or this one. So in this case, it is exclusive or because we know there are only two cases and one of them has to be true, the other one has to be false. So I'll label this one E and I'll label this one F. So now we utilize C, which is right here. This is C, okay? So we say C and E. Um, works out, okay, because, you know, the negation of 1 and 0 is 0. On the other hand, C and F leads to a contradiction, because in that case, you have the negation of 0 and 1, and that gives you a one. But we already we already know that T1 is a zero, so that means we can rule out F, so E has to be the right answer. Okay, so now I just take this part here. Yeah, I know I'm running out of space, so I have to do this thing here because I don't want to open up a new piece of paper. So this concludes, okay? This means you know, we can now conclude um, 
x0 is a 1 and y0 is a 0. There we go. All right, so I'm going to pause here and see if you guys have any questions. Can you follow the reason? I know it looks kind of all over the place, but can you follow the reasoning? So knowing that you may have a question of the same nature as this question here, what are you going to do? Yep. Write down definitions. Write down the definitions. Yes, that would be very important. <clears throat> and what, what about this slide here? I mean, remember, you can bring anything that is either handwritten or printed prior to the test. And this is being recorded right now. So that means you can go to YouTube, watch this whole thing, freeze the frame, pause the whole thing, take a screenshot, print it out. You can do that. The question is, why do you want to do that? Mm -hmm. Because these types of questions may be answered. It's the, exactly, but it's the format of the answer that you might find useful, okay? I'm going to have to start with this, and this implies that one of these two possibilities that you know connects to the definition, and that leaves, like, you know, leave, leaves us with these two constraints, and then I combine the constraints, and then we start to resolve the actual value of the individual bits. But you're not going to see this exact question. I can guarantee you that. So do not try to over-memorize the answers because that is not going to be helpful. What is helpful is look at the approach. Okay, look at the way that I solved the problem. What techniques did I use? That would be useful. Connecting what is known to the definitions, use the definitions to give you constraints. Combine the constraints so that you can rule out certain cases so they can lock down the actual value of the individual bits. That's the strategy. That still be, would still be useful, but the exact line of reasoning may not be applicable, applicable in your own exam. Are we doing okay so far with this? Any questions, any comments, any request to expand on the answer? No. Okay. All right. So you can use labels the same way that I do. You can use arrows, lines, and stuff like that. Um, there are other shorthands you can also use. You can use these three dots. Does anyone know what these three dots represent in math? This is it's because. <laughs> Close. Okay. This is because, and then this is therefore, or hence, or that's. However, whatever fancy word you want to use. But in mathematical notation, it's just three dots. So this can help potentially help save you time because you can just use those things you know, to you know, kind of explain your answer. All right. So if we don't have any questions right now, I'm just double checking. I'm still recording. The sound is good. The picture is good you know, because I do want to check occasionally because I have, do I have done stupid things before. <clears throat> All right, so we're going to start a new slide. So once again, you don't have to busy, you know, copying everything down because you know, it's being recorded right now. It's going to be on YouTube. What you do need to write down is what is your thoughts, okay? You go like, oh, okay, this is going to be important for me, so I'm going to write down my own thoughts in my notes. That is what you need to write down. Not so much the detail because if it's being recorded, you don't need to write that down. All right, so we're going to move on to uh, the next kind of question, which is question number six. So question number six, okay, I'm just going to read out the question first. It says, you know, recall that VU, WM, is the unsigned interpreted value of the binary number W using the least significant n bits. Okay, so this one does not give you the definition of VU of something. It just says that, okay, I assume that you know it already. So now you know what you need to do to prepare for the exam. Okay, go through everything that we talk about in class, in lecture, 
go through the modules as well, okay? Because there are certain things in the module that I might have neglected to mention in class in the lecture, and vice versa. Certain things I talk about in class may not be in the module, so you need both, okay, to find everything that you need. Um, let VU X3 be 5, VU Y3 be 6, answer the following parts in the specified order. Note that each part needs to be answered satisfactorily in order for the following part to be graded, okay? So that means if somebody skip the first three section and jump to the fourth part and go like, okay, this is my answer to the fourth one, I'm not gonna grade it, okay? So these have to be answered in order and they have to be answered satisfactorily, which does not mean that they have to be answered 100% correctly. It simply means that it has to show me that this person who's answering these questions understand enough, okay? There may be some clerical mistakes, there may be some, you know, um, um, omissions, you know, minor omissions. Those are not the problem, okay? You know, but if they're entirely missing, I have a problem with that. So I'm going to write down the um, question itself first, and then we'll switch back to the tablet, okay? So we, v, uh, VUX3 is 5, VUY3 is... Six and part one is asking you figure out the binary representation of x and y. Show all steps for each bit. Both the binary representations of x and y should be three bit. Okay. All right. So we'll switch to the tablet right now. Okay. So we have this. Okay. So the first thing we need to do is to remember um, how do we calculate the five and how do we calculate the six. Now these are unsigned because of the U, you know, we know that we are looking at the unsigned interpretation. So we already know how to do this phase conversion. There's an equation for this, okay? So the equation for this one is dig digit I is the floor of whatever value divided by uh, the base raised to the power of I, and then you mod the result of the floor of that division with the base itself. This is not a new equation. You should not have to write it down. You should have written it down already in your notes as we talk about this concept, okay? So once again, this is not exactly, you can call it a definition, I just call it an equation because you know, there's also an explanation of why it works out this way. But do you understand what it means, okay? What does this equation do? So that's the next question, okay? Knowing the equation itself is not helpful unless you know what the equation is doing. What is the purpose of the equation? What is, it, what is it trying to solve, given what else, okay? So can somebody help answer that question? If you do the digit i of the final number, mm -hmm. um, yeah, given the value of the base. Okay, very good. So, so that means, you know, x of 0 is really just the value, which in this case is 5, divided by 2 to the power of 0, the whole thing, mod 2, x of 1, kind of the same thing. It is tedious, but it's not really that time consuming. Okay, x of 2 is 5 divided by 2 to the power, two to the power of 2, the whole thing mod 2, and y is the same way, y0 is 5 divided, oops, 6 in here, 6 divided by 2 to the power of 0, the whole thing, not 2, by 1 is this, and the y2 is that. Whew. All right. So can we carry out these calculations? The first one, you know, with x0, um, 5 divided by 1 is 5. 5 mod 2 is a 1. 5 divided by 2 is a 2, 2.5. And the floor of 2.5 is 1. 1 mod 2 is, wait, wait, hold on a second. I just, I messed up. 5 divided by 2 is 2.5. The floor of 2.5 is 2. 2 mod 2 is a 0. On to the third one here. So 5 divided by 4 is 1.25. The floor of that is just 1. 1 mod 2 is 1. And then over here, we have 6. 6 divided by 1, 
with this one is 6. 6 mod 2 is a 0. 6 divided by 2 is 3. 3 mod 2 is a 1. 6 divided by 4 is 1.5. The floor of 1.5 is 1. 1 mod 2 is 1. So now we know x as a bit pattern is 1, 0, 1 in base 2. y as a bit pattern is 1, 1, 0 in base 2. Yep. Where do you get the value of uh, b from? b is base, so in this case it's base 2, because we are doing binary numbers. Mm -hmm. All right. So uh, do we have any questions about this? Nope. Okay. So this is basically just your base conversion. All right. Switching back to the question, we will now take a look at part two. So part two here says, you know, in a binary subtraction using borrow look ahead, show all steps starting with the definitions to figure out P and G. P and G should be also three bit wide. You can also show your answer in individual bits if you want to. If you choose the multi-bit method, you can use a notation such as 1100 as a 4-bit pattern, um, bitwise exclusive OR with 1010 you know, is 1110. Now, this is just an example of the format of the answer. This question has nothing to do with 4 bits nor exclusive OR. This is just you know, me showing how you can use a multi-bit operation if you want to save yourself some time. Okay. So be very careful when I give you a hint of you know, what the format of the answer should look like because almost, okay, I shouldn't say almost, guaranteed, okay, the example that I will give you is not related to the question itself other than what format I want you to use. Okay. All right, so we'll take a look at that. So it asks you about the G definition, the P definition, and then ask you to figure out all the bits, right? So can someone tell me how P of I is defined and how G of I is defined in a borrow look ahead setup? So once again, we go back to definitions. See, another penny in my pocket. <laughs> Where did we talk about this? Did you write it down in your notes, okay, when we talk about this? Yes? P of I <clears throat> is the um, negation of x, i, plus y, i. Or y, i, yep, mm -hmm. but the notation is plus, but it no, means that's, that's or, mm -hmm. that's fine. And then uh, G of i is the negation of x, i, uh, y, i. Yep, that means conjunction. Very good, okay. So, good job, okay, so... <clears throat> If you know where to find the definition, that's fine. If you have it already memorized, even better. I do not really expect a lot of people to have it memorized because we have a lot of definitions in this, in this class. But knowing where to find it is really important. Okay? So that means that you, at least you have to read through all your own notes and find out, okay, we talked about this when we talked about subtraction, and this is the borrow look ahead you know, definition of P and G. So, and, and you want to prepare your own study guide for the exam, okay? In other words, prepare a few sheets of paper so that you can bring those paper to the exam and things are easy to look up on those few sheets of paper, if any, okay? Um, I would say someone who's well prepared for the exam should be able to fit everything on one page, with average you know, writing, okay, some people tend to use, write really big and some people write really small. <clears throat> you are not limited in terms of how many, how much stuff you can bring with you. You can bring entire binders if you, if you want. If you have collected all the past exams about for this class, you can bring all of those with the solutions, with all the past exams, okay? It's okay because your exam is gonna be different, okay? All right, so I answered the first question. So now we just have to answer what is P of zero. P of zero is not the negation of X zero or Y zero in this case. Um, if I remember correctly, X zero is a one. So we have a negation of one or and the Y zero is a zero. 
So now we have zero or zero, which is a zero. Now, do you have to really spell it out like this much? No, you just have to kind of mention, you know, you know, I would say this part here is important, this part here is important, and then the final answer part here is also important. P of one, okay? X of one is a zero, okay? So I'm just gonna shortcut the whole thing. Okay, the negation of X one or Y one, negation of a zero, or one, and that becomes a one or one, which is a one. P of two is the negation of x two or y two. It is the negation of one or one, and that becomes zero or one, and that means it is a one. Okay. Any questions? Those are all the P's. G's kind of the same thing, except we have ands. So we have you know, the negation of x0 and y0. So that means if we have the negation of 1 and it with a 0. So now we have 0 and 0, which is a 0. G of 1 is the negation of x1 and y0, y1. OK, there we go. So um, x1 is a 0. So we have the negation of a 0. y1 is a 1. So we now have 1 and 1, which is a 1. G of 2, same thing. You know, this is the negation of x2 and y2. x2 is a 1, so the negation of that, oops, this is negation of 1 and 1, because y2 is a 1 as well. So now we have 0 and 1, which is a 0. All right, so this is sufficient as an answer because you know, I mentioned that you can combine all three bits into just P and G, or you can spell out each individual bit, which is exactly what I have done. So if you're not familiar with multi-bit operation, do it this way. This is a whole lot easier because everything is spelled out. On the other hand, if you're familiar with a multi-bit gate or the equivalence as an operator, then you can just you know, combine all those bits and you know, kind of do the bitwise operation. So that's up to you, okay? The question says you can do it either way. All right, do we have any questions before we move on to the next part of the same question? Okay, all right, so I'm looking at the time. I think we can finish up this question, take roll, and then move on to the next question. So we'll go ahead and do it that way. Okay, part three, for 25%, show the volume of the head equation of P3, your answer should start with P3 equals two. So this is strictly a knowledge question. In other words, how do we define T3? All right, so even I cannot remember that one, so I have to look it up. So let's look it up and let's see, where's my mouse pointer? Okay, there we go. And it is in the um, addition module. You go like, but aren't we doing subtraction? Yes, we're doing subtraction, but the addition module actually talks about the what K3 looks like. And I have mentioned that T3 has exactly the same structure, except instead of K, we turn it into T. Okay, so that's, what, that's why I put here. So that means you know, for that particular question, all you have to do is to mention that T3 is G of 2 or P of 2 and G of 1 or P of 2, P of 1 and G of 0 or P of 2, P of 1, P of 0 and T of 0. Okay, so let me switch back to the tablet so you can see what the answer is. This is for part 3 of that question. That's 25% just for being able to copy and paste, basically. <clears throat> there is a little bit of understanding involved because I did mention in class how you know, the borrow look-ahead structure is exactly the same as the carry look-ahead structure. So that's the one piece of reasoning that you have to do to remember how to get to the answer of this question. This is for part three. So now we move on to part four. Okay, so let's go back to the question. So part four is asking, assuming T of zero is a zero, substitute the bits of P and G in the borrow of the head equation of T3, and then compute all the conjunctions, then compute the disjunction, show all steps, okay, show all mentions, the computations. 
So that means you cannot just give me a single answer of, oh, T1 is this, okay? That is almost going to get nothing, okay? No points whatsoever. So instead, what do you do? Okay, so this is for part three. So part four is combining part three with part two, okay? So now you say T3 is, okay, so we look up, okay, let me see if I can do this. Okay, so we'll, we'll copy and paste. There we go. So we are going to take this portion, and this looks like copy to me, and then we'll just paste it here. So paste here, and then we can move it to a corner. Move it down. Okay, there we go. So now we know exactly what P0, P1, P2, G0, G1, D2 are. T0 is assumed to be a zero, so we have all the bits now. So now uh, this refers to G2, and G2 is a zero. Oops, I uh, have to switch back to the pen tool. There we go. So we got a zero here, and then P2 is a one, and then G1 is also a one, and then P2 is a one, P1 is a one, G0 is a zero. So we have one and one and zero here. And now we have all the P bits. So we have one, one, zero, one, one, zero. And then T0 is also a zero. Spell it out first, okay? Now we perform the conjunction because the question asks, what are the results of the conjunctions? So we look at this conjunction, go like, that's a one, that's a zero, that is also going to be a zero. Then we have a disjunction. So now you look at all of these and you say, what is one or zero or zero? That is a one. That will give me all the points I need uh, in question number four, because I did all the steps as required or as specified by the question. Now, is that the only way to spell out the whole thing? Can I you know, just kind of use the circuit diagram instead with all the and is and or gates? Yeah, that's fine too. So the representation is not super important as long as I find everything that the question is asking you to, you know, to put into the answer. All right. Are we doing okay so far? Okay. So I'm going to take row. Okay. So let me go back to here and here. So you can go ahead and sign in to either your mobile device or you know, Canvas, you know, using the computer in front of you. Um, let's see, today is the 20th. So I do have to emphasize, you know, this role-taking activity is what I use to take role, which means, you know, without, you know, this, you know, with, with no activities indicated here, it will be counted as an absent, which also means, you know, people really should be here on time for the class because there's no telling when I'm going to do this. All right, so the access code is X1. That's the uh, access code. So let me publish. I think you have enough time to do it. Yeah, you have until 11.30 to do it. We've got six more minutes, so that's plenty of time. The reason why I wanted people to be here, you know, on time. Yes, go ahead. I think the due date is... Oh, I messed it up. Oh, today is the twentieth. I got the date right. Oh, okay. I changed one of them, but not the other one. Sorry. Okay, that's my bad. Because I changed one without changing this one. September twentieth, eleven thirty a.m. Okay, try again. Thank you. So the reason why I take role is because there's a strong correlation between absences and the performance or the overall grade in the class. Um, it's not, I do not know which way is which way, whether it's a causal relationship or whether it's just a correlation, but there's a very strong correlation between those two. I have data to demonstrate it as well. So that's why I try to get people in class, okay, you know, to be here. 
All right. Are we good so far? Okay. Is anyone does anyone need more time to take roll? Nope. Okay. All right. So we are going back to the exam, and now we're tackling question number seven. So question number seven is kind of the same deal, similar but not exactly the same. We call the P S and W N is the sign interpretation of the pin pattern. W is the least significant M bit. You are given that X is an M bit minimum and M bit uh, and Y is an M bit subtract. So in the exam, I will not explain what is a minimum and what is a subtract because those terms have been introduced already. Okay. But, you know, I also further explain, um, and D is the result of x minus y, that tells you which one is which one, right? You know, so I'm not only just giving you those you know, awkward terms, but I'm also giving you a clue afterwards. It's like, okay, if you don't remember the, term, the terms, here is you know, the context of how x and y are being used. All right, so turn this one a little bit here. Word. Oh, the word. The word? Oh, you mean the tablet? Yeah. It's all being recorded. <laughs> so there's no need to do your own screenshot. So instead of doing your own screenshot, wait until the video is available, and then you can you know, jot down the time, okay, so you know exactly which moment you need to go to to take a screenshot. There we go. All right, so for number seven, we discovered that V S D M, which is the difference, is negative 14, V S D X M is 11, and V S Y M is negative seven. So we already know the subtraction, you know, or the, the result of the subtraction. Note that the scoring of this question, the you know, same thing with, you know, has part dependency. In other words, a later part may not have been scored if an earlier part is incorrect or omitted and I have incorrect spelled incorrectly, which is ironic. What is the definition of VSWN for some bit pattern W with a bit width of N? That is actually introduced in class quite a few times when we talked about signed versus unsigned representation. It is not in the module, okay, it is, but it is in the discussion in class, in the lecture. So you should remember that VS W and I think it's M, right? N is the sigma notation going from zero to N minus two in this case, X, uh, W, okay, not X. So W, come on, erase, there we go. So W of I times two to the power of I minus, okay? So the second part is the most important part. It's minus W of N minus one times two to the power of n minus one. That's the definition of the VS, okay, the signed interpretative value of a big pattern W using only up to n bits. Okay, so knowing the definition is one thing, knowing what it is for is the other thing. Okay, so we now have to look at this, but that's all I'm asking for part one. So this is good for part one of question number seven because all it asks is what is the definition. That's a knowledge question, which is the lowest level question that I can ask is, do you know blah, blah, blah? And the blah, blah, blah is mentioned in class. All right, second part. What is the range of the sign value that can be represented using n bits? Specify the most negative value and the most positive value given signed integer, the signed integer has n bits. The answer to this part should be used to help to answer the next two parts. Okay. You go like, did we talk about this? This is actually in the module. So where do you find this? Okay, so let's just say that I have not read the modules at all. Okay, and I'm just totally fresh to this and go like, okay, but if Tech said that this is in the modules, which module would this belong to? Signed versus unsigned, because that's the first time that we talk about negative values. We have never talked about negative values before that. So that means it's in the signed versus unsigned representation. 
So once you get here, okay, the mentioning of that range is in its own paragraph. Uh, negative values. Da, 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 da. Where did I put it? Right here. So generally speaking, given a W bit integer, so you have to remember the symbols are used a little bit differently here. So W is indicating the number of bits in the integer. The range of unsigned uh, value is from 0 to 2 to the power of 2 minus 1. That's for unsigned. For signed, okay, right here, the value range is from negative 2 to the power of the number of bits minus 1 to positive 2 to the power of the number of bits minus 1. Oh, I forgot minus 1 here. And then the whole thing minus 1. All right, so I said the same thing yesterday. I'll say the same thing today, okay? This is the fun part of teaching two sections of the same class, is if you have not read the module, you have to ask yourself why you have not read the modules. If you have read the modules, but you have never noticed this part, then you have to, you have to ask the question why you have never noticed about this part of the module. If you have read the module, and you know this is in the module, but you cannot quite you know, remember the definition, then you have to ask yourself, why have I, why have I not written these things into all, onto my own notes? So those are the questions that I would ask if I were you. Am I going to you know, say, if you have not read the module, I'm going to you know, deduct points? No. I have no idea who has read the module and who has not read the module. Can I indirectly find out who has and who has not? Yeah, I know how my way around your web servers and you know, how to um, correlate your IP addresses and so on. I can potentially figure that out. But why do I want to do that? I, do, I, I, I don't have time to do that. So I'm mentioning this for your benefit, okay? Because you know, if you want to be successful, in college level classes, especially in a four year university, that is what you need to do. Okay, make sure you go through all the reading material, and as you read, understand the material and write down your notes, especially anything relating to this type of thing, definitions, and so on. Be good so far. So if you're thinking, Tag, you're treating me like a child, the answer is, yes, I am. So look at it as a positive thing, okay? It's not negative. All right, so moving on. So now we know the range. So I'm just going to copy this down, right? This is just copy and paste. So we are just going to say negative 2 to the power of n minus 1. That's the most negative value, 2, 2 to the power of negative 2 to the power of n minus 1, the whole thing minus 1. So switch back to the answer here. That's for part 2. All right, so let me go back to the question here. Oh, no, there we go. All right, so now we have 25% of all the points with question number 7. So for the next one, is 30%. Show the steps of how you figure out the minimum number of bits, x, uh, m of x, to represent x equals to 11 as a signed integer, what is the minimum m of x such that dsxmx is 11? Okay, so how do we answer that particular question? There are a few ways to do this, okay? If you want to do it the really easy way, you basically just have to use the answer to of question number two and just say, okay, what if w is, what if n is 1? Not, not going to do it. What if n is 2? Not going to do it. What if n is 3? Not going to do it. 4? Not going to do it. It has to be 5. So that's one way to do it. But how do you write that answer, right? So we'll go ahead and take a look at how the answer may look like for part 3, knowing that x is 11. So I'm switching back here. So we know x is 11. So what we know is 11 has to be less than or equal to the highest or the most positive value that you can represent using n bits. So that becomes the inequality for you to solve, and you want the n to be as small as possible. So for someone who knows about log and stuff like that, you can go like, oh, I can solve this using log. 
uh, we add one on both sides so that 11 becomes a 12 and it is less than or equal to 2 to the power of n minus 1. We solve for the exponent of the 2 and then we just have to remember to add 1 to n because if this is n minus 1. Yeah, that's one way to solve it if you're comfortable with log method. But this is not a really difficult problem. You can just do it step by step, okay? So you can say, I'm just going to do it in a stupid way like this. Okay, I wouldn't say stupid. It's just, you know, it, it doesn't involve a lot of higher math. It's false. 3 minus 1 is false. Okay, it's done. So, is this a legitimate method? Yes. Okay, it's a linear search. It's not the most efficient, but I'm not giving you an insanely large number where you have to go like, oh, I need to set up a loop. You know, go through like 16 times. No, it's just like six times. Is that okay? Does everybody understand this particular approach? It is perfectly okay for this test. Want us to all those? Well, you kind of have to show me why you chose five. <laughs> you can show just the four and the five so that you can say that, okay, if I have one fewer bits, it's not going to be enough. So that would be okay too. But you cannot just say five because you have to show me that this is the least number of bits that you need. All right, so that's one. And then we move on to question number four. Let me go back to the question. Uh, so this time we are showing that y is negative 7, and we're asking the same question. So now we have to look at 7, and we say, so for 7, we are looking at the negative side of the range, right? So now we have to say negative 2 to the power of 1 minus 1 is, is greater than uh, negative 7, which is the value that we want to represent. So... Uh, or I can say this is less than or equal to, this is false. It is not less than or equal to, same thing, okay, 2 minus 1, that, mean, that means negative 2 is less than negative 7, is false. Negative 4 is less than negative 7, is false. 4 minus 1, which gives us a negative 8, is less than or equal to negative 7, is true. Woohoo, done. So four is the least number of bits that we can we have to use to represent negative seven. It's a binary number. Is that okay? All right. So we have a few more parts. Okay, so we'll move on to part five. Okay. So the question asks in part five, find out what is the maximum between mx and my. Okay. So I'm switching back here. So mx is 5, my is 4, so we so the maximum is 5. So we move on to the number 6, okay? Number 6 is asking, uh, is the subtraction result of these two, which is 11 minus negative 7, is it within, is it out of the range of the previous step, which is this step here? The previous step, I think, is referring to Five bits, five bits, which is the previous step. Use the previous parts to help answer this question. So now that we know we need five bits to represent the integers, the question is, if you look at 11 minus negative 7, is that value within the range that we can represent using only five bits as signed integers? Okay, so... You say negative minus 11, uh, neg 11 minus negative 7 would give us 18. And 18 is greater than 2 to the power of 5 minus 1, the whole thing minus 1. So is true. So the result of 11 minus negative 7 is out of range. 
That's it. So each part is making use of something that you figure out in the previous part. Before this, this semester, I usually just ask like a long question, you know, but then people do not know how to do it step by step. So now I do it kind of have a guided you know, micro steps so that people know, oh, okay, I need to do this first, then I need to do this, then I need to do this. And some people who cannot finish all the steps can still get partial credit by finishing some of the steps. All right, that's it. That's the entire test, okay? Or I have covered all the questions in the exam of spring 2023. Do we have any questions? Yep. How many questions will our test have? I do not know yet. <laughs> <laughs> um, I typically make up the exam questions like one or two days before the exam. So right now, it's still brewing in my head. The challenge is I do not ask the same question twice, you know, as, at least as far as I can remember. So that means, you know, if I know this is from last semester, I have to figure out a new way, figure out a new way to ask questions, testing the same kind of knowledge and also problem solving skills, but in a different way. So that's usually a challenge for me. It's also kind of like a puzzle for me to solve, but it takes time. Yep. Another question. Mm -hmm. So will we have to finish this test by the end of the lecture section? Yes. Or can we... Uh, the lecture. So this is within 80 minutes. So there are a few things you should know before going into the test. There are, there may be occasions where no one in the class can finish all the questions. In which case, you know, well, okay. So even without that situation happening, I typically rescale the score of the test. So this class has about 25 people right now. So what I do is I look at the third highest score of the entire class out of the test and use that as the new 100%. So I rescale the whole class based on the third highest score, which means two people in this class will get more than 100%. I don't think anyone is going to complain about that. Now, this is nice in a way, but also not helpful in a way. Because for people who get a zero out of the entire test, this is not going to help. Because no matter how you rescale a zero, it is still a zero when you're just rescaling using a ratio. So, so, but I mentioned this because I, I don't want people to panic because, oh, no one in the class can finish the entire test, so the whole class is going to flunk. Nope, because your score is going to, going to be rescaled, so it is more about relatively speaking, where you are in class. But what if I gave you a test, this entire class is so well prepared, everybody is getting 95 to 100%. Am I going to rescale that 95% back down to zero so that I have the full range of A, B, C, D, F again? The answer is no. I would just give you all A's in this test. I don't have a problem with everybody being able to finish and excel in the test. That is not a problem. It is only when the score is, all, you know, is really low, you know, below what I think it should be, then I rescale everything so that you know, it's, it's correct again. All right, so that's one thing. The second thing is if you get a 65% of score out of this particular test, what letter grade does it co correspond to? Because I need to mention this ahead of time because I don't want people to panic. See. Hmm? No, it's a B, yes, 62% and up to 87.5% is a B. Okay, so this is telling me who has not read the syllabus or at least not remember from the syllabus. <laughs> okay, I do have to mention this kind of stuff because the way I score the test is not your typical scale. Um, because I do not believe in this 60% you have to fill it up before you get a D. Why do we have to do that? I mean, that just, it, it just doesn't make sense to me. Just because everybody else is doing it does not make, does not make it make sense. So um, I do want to mention this. This is really important. So the meaning of 0 to um, 4, so in terms of percentage, so you can see um, a C is, you know, has a center of 50%. So I think there's a range here. There, there we go. 
So I don't think anyone's going to complain that anyone getting 12.5% or less is going to get an F. Right? Okay. But to get a D is going from 12.5% to 37.5%. Uh, to get a C, which is what you need to quote unquote pass the class with a letter grade of C or better, so they can transfer, you can get it into a degree, is 37.5% to 62.5%. That is a C. So that means the quote unquote passing percentage is 37.5% post adjustment. Now, the danger of talking about this is for people to underestimate <laughs> the difficulty to pass this class. I don't want to do that either, okay? I just want to give you guys the facts, okay? These are all in the syllabus. You should have read it already or at least watched the video already. So a B is from 62.5% to 87.5%. That whole range are Bs and then As are from 87.5% or more. These are all just corresponding to A, B, C, D, F as GPAs. Because what is the GPA of a B? Come on, you guys can tell me. It's a three, it's three out of four, which is 75%. So 75% is the center between this number and this number. And that is why I chose those as the threshold to get into a specific grade. So for every single question, for every single part, for every single uh, rubric for each part of each question, I grade using 0 to 4 as a scale. And then the weights will be entered according to the weight you know, as disclosed in the exam itself. So 10%, 15%, 30%, 30%, 10%, and 5%. And then the weighted average becomes the actual score for this question. And all the questions carry equal weight. So you know, no matter how many questions you get, they all carry equal weight. So what do you do when you first get your exam question? Spot the easy ones. Get those done first. Okay? Leave the most difficult one to last. And then time yourself. Okay? I'm giving you guys general strategy of how to take an exam. Let's say I give you eight questions, okay? because eight is a really nice and even number. So let's say I give you eight questions, and you have 80 minutes. So that means you really want to time yourself and, and use no more than 10 minutes per question. So this way you have enough time to try and attempt every single question. Okay. Now, if I were you, I would give myself maybe seven minutes per question so that I would have about, about in this case, 60 minutes at the end so that I can go back to an earlier question that I do not feel comfortable with or it is incomplete, then I have time to go back and answer that question. But that just, that's just my strategy. I have seen a lot of people using too much time on a single question, and then they could not complete all of the other ones. But it's possible some of the later ones is actually easier than the earlier one. So you know, do not you know, miss some of the earlier, some of the easier questions by putting too much time into some of the earlier questions. So you have to time yourself. Yep. Okay. So on the so the next one. No, there will be a lab section, but I will still be around for people who want to talk about the, the test itself. Right. So after, basically after we finish our exam, we can just leave if you want to. That is correct. Okay. Yep. Mm -hmm. All right, any other questions? No other questions? So this exam is 20% of your final score, okay? So I want to give people a perspective as well, is what if you flunk this test entirely, like getting a zero out of the entire thing? Well, then you just took 20% out of 100%, so your new highest possible score is 80%. But 80% is still a B. So that means you know, for someone who has flunked this, this exam, exam one entirely, that person will still be able to get an B out of the class. An A is out of reach, but a B is still within reach. Okay, so I want to kind of mention all of these things ahead of time because I don't want to see people panicking, but at the same time, I also don't want I don't want people to underestimate the, the exam either. So kind of have to find a balance between those two. All right. So are you guys feeling okay about the whole thing? Knowing what to do, how to prepare for the exam. 
Okay, so remember, it's open book and open notes. But I cannot give you anything during the exam, nor can other students. So you have to be responsible for what you need to take the exam. Everything from writing instruments to pieces of paper to write your answer on, and also the you know stuff that you want to bring in with you you know during the exam. Um, and also, you know, headphones, earphones, anything electronic would not be allowed during the test. So just put those away. You know, I don't need those to be here. You just cannot be wearing your Bluetooth or have your cell phone out, you know, during the exam. Any other questions, concerns that you want to ask before we end today's class? There's no lab today, but if anyone wants to kind of go back to the stuff that we talked about today with exam one, I'll be here to talk about that, but I will leave the lab as soon as no one is remaining in the classroom. All right. With all that said, it's time for us to end the lecture. The whole thing is recorded. Okay. Just want to make sure that you guys feel comfortable that we can revisit any part of this deal you know, in the lecture.